Hi there, I'm your host, Clive Sirkin, and welcome to the Unstuck Podcast, where we're on a journey to help you get control of your work environment, get yourself unstuck, and perform to your full potential. Welcome to this week's episode of Unstuck. Um, I try as best as I can to get as diverse a group of guests on the show And I got to tell you, today's guest brings a whole new dimension to the notion of Unstuck, and hopefully you will agree. Um, Big welcome to my Welsh-born, Leeds-cultivated, Chicago-adopted new friend, Mr. John Langford. Welcome, mate. Good afternoon, Clive. How are you? Very official. (laughs) I'm great, mate. (laughs) We get it. You know, I was just thinking. It's like one o'clock, and we're recording. We get a. We get. We may have to do a re-record over a pint. It's a lot more uh, conducive to good conversation. Well, it, it does. Uh, it does get the stories flowing a little more smoothly. Yeah. We'll, we'll, do, we'll we'll do a version two point oh. But let me just start by saying, for the five of you who don't know who John Langford is, um, let me give you a little bit of an intro. And since this is a podcast that's only thirty minutes, I'll try and keep this down to about ten minutes of an intro. But John is uh, one of the founding members of the legendary Mekons and the Three Johns, the Waco Brothers, the Fine, ben, Fine Pine Valley Cosmonauts, and likely a few other shenanigans that, that, I, that I don't know about and haven't done enough research on. Um, and if that's not enough, he's an accomplished artist, painter, graphic designer, prolific album cover producer, and T-shirt maker. And finally, and most importantly, a connoisseur of fine beer. What did I leave out? Yeah, I don't know. You got it all, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I like the uh, the narrative, the little narrative you got there, like leads to, I mean, Newport's a leads to Chicago. Yeah, it's a good that's story. Kind of, that's kind of my life story, you know. And it's uh, it's all tied up with, you know, what I wanted to do as a kid and what I've ended up doing now. So, well, I, let's start there. I mean, let's talk about the Mekons. I mean, this band was formed in '76, give or take. Yeah. Well, the first time I met the guys from the Mekons was my first day at Leeds University, where I'd gone, hopefully, to study fine art and mainly to get out of my little Welsh, grey, rainy seaport town and go somewhere more <laughs> cosmopolitan. And, and I chose Leeds, which was Leeds in the 1970s, in, in my memory, is kind of permanently in black and white. And it was much more similar to where I'd come from than than different, although it was bigger and even more industrial, and it wasn't by the sea. Yeah, it, it was an uh, interesting place because the, there was a u- big university there and the Polytechnic, and they both had fine art departments, quite large fine art departments. And they were both not on some sort of campus out of town. They were both right in the middle of the downtown area. So there was a lot of kind of stuff going on. And the moment I arrived there, punk rock happened. Uh, the Sex Pistols were, you know, swore and stuff on the TV, and the whole country suddenly went into this seismic kind of polar, polarized kind of culture war, where you know you're either a punk or you hated punks, and uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. Nothing I've in between. Student up in Leeds, I, I fell into the uh, the former camp, the late, the, the sorry, the latter camp. <laughs> no, did I hate punks? No, I didn't hate punks. I don't know which camp I fell into. I became uh, very open to these kind of new ideas that were going on because punk rock was very political and it was very hands-on. It was very do-it-yourself. Uh, it was about, up in Leeds at least, maybe we mis- misread the smoke signals coming from the music industry and the fashion business down in London, but we saw it as a license to do whatever you wanted and uh, took it as that, and we saw it stretching out beyond music, into art and into um, into business in a sense of where you, you know, people started making their own record labels, people started booking their own gigs. And I always felt the early 70s, mid 70s, when I was a teenager, I was kind of robbed of it, having an exciting time because all the bands were like these kind of prog rock hippie bands that came around and played stadiums and sang about elves and wizards and you know, it wasn't really my scene. And uh, punk was, you know, came a little late because I was, I was already 18, 19 years old. But there I was away from home for the first time. And the first people I met in Leeds, I formed a band with. And the premise of the band, because, you know, we were art students and we were iconoclasts and uh, there were no rules anymore because of punk rock. The first thing we said was that somebody asked me, do you want to be in a band where no one can play? 
Yeah. And that sounds preposterous, but at the time it made total sense. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. So we were renowned for not being able to play our instruments, of course. Well, it's interesting because, and my understanding is like, A, as you said, nobody was really a musician. B, yeah. in the beginning, you kind of, there, were, there was a gang of four, right? And you guys just sort of used their instruments when they weren't playing. They were the proper band, yeah. They were the proper band, <laughs> yeah. and then and 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 now seven, you know, f- you know, forty years later, you know, one of if not the largest, longest running bands, one of the most prolific in terms of content production. But I, it may be helpful, like talk about what was going on in in the mid seventies in lead in the context of what was going on in England broadly in terms of, like that was at the height of the conflict around, you know, Maggie Thatcher's in control. Well, Thatcher was kind of coming, but, there, yeah. you know, you could feel her coming. You could feel people's disillusionment. It was like the long hangover of the 60s. There was a lot of, I mean, the country was just really poor. I remember being in the north of England, it was really surprising how much abject poverty there was and, and just, you know, nobody doing anything with infrastructure and, it was just that the place was kind of a mess. And you look at photographs of Leeds then, now, and it's quite a, it's quite shocking. That was what you know we arrived in. So punk was kind of like, I don't know. It was there, there was a there was a whole wave of the post-war years where you know we all watched movies about Spitfire pilots on the TV and felt very proud of ourselves for defeating the Nazis. That this is different. Of, that goodwill had kind of run out as well by then. You know, my sense was a lot of anger, right? A lot yeah, of frustration. It was just, there was nothing for there was nothing for kids. You know, I mean, there was like football hooliganism, <laughs> and there had been the glam rock thing, which I thought for me was quite, you know, quite exotic and quite wild. But it wasn't really political. But a band like the Clash. They kind of, I, I really like the Clash because they kind of brought something into uh, white boy rock and roll, which was that spirit that was already going on in uh, reggae music, and uh, particularly the sort of reggae music that was popular in the inner cities of Britain. And we heard a lot of that in Leeds, and uh, there were riots, you know, every year in Notting Hill. The police special patrol group would go down there just like with a specific purpose of beating on beating the shit out of the youth you know and it was a it was an interesting time because the reggae kids had this kind of attitude they had this rebel stance which was a lot more kind of interesting than the sort of boy meets girl kind of shock weirdness of glam rock roxy i loved roxy music i loved david bowie but somehow what the clash and the pistols brought in different ways was this kind of like headlong confrontation with reality and what was going on in the streets. And I don't think some of them, you know, some people might say that was kind of like a, just another phase in the kind of music biz, another sort of another trend, another thing to be used to sell records. But it tapped into something, tapped into something real for kids on the street. And it brought in a lot of the kids who maybe were more interested in, you know, football and street life than they were interested in, uh, the sort of music that was prevalent in the in the seventies, before that, uh, the hairy you know drug music, yeah. and suddenly there was a there was a different thing going on altogether. And it really what attracted us to it was how we were kind of in control of it. So a lot of the clubs that, that were going on in Leeds at that time were, you know, there was like an art rock against racism club that was you know run by musicians and people around the bands. It wasn't, you know, it was it was kind of this. This the the business end of the rock industry in uh, Britain hadn't got a lid on it, and for a while it was a very it was a very interesting, full of opportunities and people making their own entertainment. So, and and there's a through line like of this that I want to get to, which is you'd said earlier, like th- there's this whole political content context and the and the notion of sort of expressing yourself in a way that has more real meaning. But the other part of it, it was like with no rules. And the ability to to do something and create your art without conforming to a model and a business model and a commercial model in the labels. And later on, uh, you know, you, you guys did ultimately go, and, you know, sign up with a label and twice, neither of those worked very well for you <laughs> <laughs> from a commercial sense, right? And, and, and probably with good reason, because that was, 
an anathema to what you guys were about, no? Yeah, well, our, you know, we approached it from the point of view of art students. We didn't really have any ambitions or any. We didn't. We didn't want. Um, we didn't really want to make it a career. I didn't think of it that it was going to. I mean, if you told me then, it was, I'd still be in the Mekons forty-three years later. I would have kind of laughed at you. But um, the idea was to push things and see how far they we could take them, and to sort of get in there and fiddle with what was the mechanics of the music business. It seemed like an interesting topic for us as art students, you know. <laughs> but we went the whole way. We ended up on a major label. We ended up getting dumped by a major label. We regrouped. We got together again, you know, worked again in the independent world, built the band back up, ended up on another major label by 1989 in the States with A&M. You know, it's like, you might look at it and think, you know, you never learned, did you? You never learned your lesson. But we, we always had this kind of hope that we could somehow master these dark forces and uh, <laughs> bend them to our own will. But it was usually we ended up getting a good slap in. But uh, and the best times were always when it was uh, we were we were totally in charge of what we were doing, and we put, put it on a we put our ambitions into some kind of like realistic focus where we, we could actually this is what we want to achieve this is what we want to do and it took a long time to get to that point and then it was just like well we can exist kind of outside of the, the structures of the music right. business and still do exactly what we want to do and not you know not have to compromise in any particular way Wait, although so there's always there's always compromise yes yeah. The, the, the degree of compromise and you know i remember in i was 14 or 15, 2014 15 the the documentary came out revenge of the mekons and by the way if you're listening to this um put the podcast on pause if you haven't seen revenge of the mekons go to amazon download the goddamn thing and watch it um and i rewatched it the other night off just before we went out for a pint it, it was fabulous but th there were some incredibly interesting things before we get into that, what was it like and it, doing it, number one, and number two, watching it? Because i I got to imagine it's kind of weird. Like, you're always performing. Now yeah. they make a documentary of you guys. Did you ever, I assume you watched it. Yeah, we know we had to go to all these film festivals. It was quite, it was very strange. The making of it, I would say, the Mekons, all right, it's a group of people and it's a, kind of like a community and it's kind of like a, a family in, on at this stage because we've been together so long. But I think everybody had a very different reaction to the idea of, it, of us being filmed. And I remember sort of there were moments where I would walk into a scenario where I could see the guy filming some people talking. I would just duck back out the door. <laughs> I, I don't want to be in this scene. This is, <laughs> this is like a spinal tap moment, and I just don't want to be in it. But, you know, actually the the guy had a – I think Joe, Joe Andrew who made the film – I, I trusted him from the, from the beginning because he was a friend of friends of friends, and it just seemed like he he had a, a love for the band, and I think he thought he could make something which appealed to the diehards and the sort of real serious fans, and there's something that could like you know benefit us in in the in the broader you know explain us a little bit to other people who were kind of probably not even interested in the bands, and it was I thought he meant an entertainer. The first thing I said to him was. Just don't make a boring film. If it's boring, that would be terrible. So I don't think it's boring. I think I, I know a lot of people who really enjoyed it. Possibly not many of the band really enjoyed it. And it was difficult to watch it. There's some great moments in it, actually. I mean, quite. I mean, watching it was kind of funny because I remember sitting sitting next to my my wife at the uh, <laughs> at the opening in it, 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 they, had a, they had a kind of screening in Chicago at the Lincoln Hall, and we were sat there watching it. And then Sally comes on and says, you know, why did you move to uh, America? And the guy says, oh, hey, it was so much easier to find sexual partners here. Right, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> she goes, a lot of available partners. Yeah, and she said the, the, the bar's much lower. And then my wife, my wife punches me, so I'm in his shoulder. <laughs> well, I'm watching, I go, hey, punch her, don't punch me. <laughs> Listen, but, there, were, there were some incredible, I mean, it, Again, from my perspective, when I watched it the first time, never knew. Then I meet you, and then I watch it again. It, it feels like they captured, but 
the mo- the real interesting stuff is when they cut in like the critics, the people who are arguably, you know, get music and the DJs and that, and you hear them talk about you. Know, my favorite by far, I think it was Mary Harry reads excerpts from an article she wrote about you way back when. Yeah, and like she wrote okay. that in 1978. Okay, so she wrote, I, the one line, I mean, a lot of that was brilliant, but she goes, uh, I think she said something to the effect of she felt you were a strange combination of sophisticated theory and technical incompetence, which <laughs> I bust out laughing because she just described my career. <laughs> but it kind of goes back to your point is like you guys are like fuck it let's just let's just do something and figure it yeah. out along the way i mean so, why does rock and roll have to be about i mean playing a million notes a minute that was the context at the time it was all about virtuosity with your instruments it was all that prog rock stuff and it was like who was the best lead guitarist who could play fastest and we thought it's, you know that's not what it's really about especially in a very political climate it was more about the ideas and the way, and for us, it seemed to be almost not about the music even so much as to how you conducted yourself. And I think that's a thread that's gone right through the band right till today. It's like how you actually behave in, in relation to the kind of, you know, the powers that be and what, and the, what can, those that control you. It's, it's almost like that's what's interesting about the band that we've kind of refused to, um, Oh, I mean, some, when, when we have compromised and when we have tried to be the nice guys and work with the big boys and get it going with on in a come on more conventional way, that's when we've come a cropper, you know, and that's yeah. when th- things it's, haven't it's, worked out so nicely. And basically the band almost broke up on both those occasions, but the sort of personal bonds between certain members of the band meant that the band couldn't break up because we were still going to end up in a pub together. So, <laughs> so you're, stuck, you're stuck together no matter what. Yeah, so it's like, well, we might as well make some more music because, you know, there's an attitude that always was like, you know, a bloody mindedness that I refuse to be told I can't do this. You know, and that's that's one of the main themes of the Mekons. And I think, you know, one of the things bands do is they get, they get a winning formula and they stick with it. And then you get like, when you keep, you keep, all oh, right, that's right. And then you listen to the guy at the record, that sold pretty good. If you just do this and do that, then it'll be... Well, as soon as we got anything resembling success, we used to kind of change the rules and make an album in a totally different way. Just, And I think that's sort of bloody mindedness on our part, but also kind of like it's kept it really fresh. And it's kept what, it, you have to move into, there have to be new challenges and new in, you know, influences and new kind of inspiration. Or what's the point? It's just, you're just treading water. But that was the, one of the other sort of parts that sort of really came clear in the thing and, you know, they refer to you as a punk rock band, but the reality is like there's honky tonk, there's folk. That like, do you have a point of view on like how you describe your music, or is it's it just is what it is? And you've, you've it can be anything we want it to be at this right. stage, you know. And we've even transcended the thing with not having good musicians in the band because by about 1983, all, all these great musicians started joining. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's like. I mean, we had Dick Taylor playing, still plays with us occasionally. He was in the, you know, in the original Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones. It, I love the way he described it when he joined. There was oh, a oh, he used to be in a little band you may have heard of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had the band The Pretty Things, and then, you know, we met him, and he was like a great lesson for us because he was a guy, he was driving a van for a jeans company in Brit- in London. And a friend met him and said, do you want to be, do you want to come and play with this band, The Mekons? And he was like, all right, I'll come along. And it was just great. But he's like absolutely fantastic guitar player. But he thought we were amusing. And Steve Goulding had joined and Lou Edmonds joined. Susie Honeyman's a classically trained violin player. You know, we have that sort of, we have an arsenal of people who can really play their instruments very well. And uh, and then they, for some reason, they choose to ally themselves with, you know, me and Tom and Sally who haven't really made vast gains on that front. But, you know, but... <laughs> The Mekons is, you know, as a live band, it's like, I don't know, you, you wouldn't, it's not like some kind of art school joke anymore. It never really was a joke, but it's, you know, we tried to do, we've always tried to do the best, play as well as we can with whatever resources we have. And it was never kind of like, let's, let's be shit for, for a laugh, you know. Right. Well, just so we clear, you know, Mary's, I love the way she talked about it in part because I thought she was describing my career, but 
she, this is a, an article in the context of, you know, pure admiration of what you were doing. And then, and there was a part in there where she goes like, I wonder how long they can keep doing this. Well, guess what? Um, yeah, that's the strange thing because we never we never thought about that at all. We just thought it was going to be this, you know, we just do it for a bit, and then people would. We I think what happened with us was we were kind of we got on this kind of route where we ended up on Virgin Records, and then it was kind of logical in some ways. Um, yeah, it was also insane, and then the you know the music press in Britain. We've been the, their darlings, and then suddenly they turned on us completely, and they really and we were like kind of hated, and that was like that was a bit of a shock. And we thought I kind of we felt like we still had something to to prove, you know. So we battled back a few times till yeah. you know, people had to admit we weren't complete wankers. <laughs> and there you go. Speak, course, there's speak. some out there would still would would actually disagree that they would still say we were completely. Listen, wankers. again, it goes back to the thing. you try and please everyone. You you end up pleasing no one and forget who yeah. you are. So. We basically try and please ourselves, but we like the idea of that music is more than just a, a, a way of procuring money. That maybe there's something else going on, making something interesting, and making you know the way you behave. It becomes part of a conversation about you know who we are as human beings. And that, you know, sounds a bit pompous, but that's definitely there's a there's something of that in it as well. You know? Well, it's interesting because I was talking to a, a good friend and a colleague of mine, um, Bob Blair, who's a massive fan. He's a musician himself of it. In in essentially what he's saying, he goes, "What blows me away about you as a collective and you as an individual is how you guys are sort of." diversified your artistic expression and that's part of the reason why i did the little intro there it was like part of the equation and and i assume part of it is to pay the bills but part of it is fundamental to you is how many different angles you have to express your creativity and i get the sense talking to you and, and we talked about it the other night is that's fundamental that's kind of your oxygen it, it, am i am i reading it right yeah, and I mean, just the idea, if we'd had, like, immense success with the first record, you know, on Virgin Records, I don't, we would definitely wouldn't exist now. The fact that that was kind of a bust and they kicked us off and everybody hated us, um, I think that's what inspired us to keep going. And it made it, in, it, made it interesting because we've got to kind of think about what did we do wrong, but then, like, actually, did we do anything wrong? You know, maybe what, maybe this is, there's a viable way of operating as a kind of, you know, a band or some sort of cultural entity. You know, we've done, we've branched out. We've tried to write a novel. We did that. We've done art shows. We've done, uh, you know, all sorts of mad things like comic strips, little collaborations. Co yeah. Comics was every, I mean, we did a, did a, a thing called pussy King of the pirates, which was a, a kind of, I think a journalist in sh Chicago described it as a high school level journalist. Um, <laughs> I saw show. some clips of it. That was yeah, hysterical. It was fantastic, though. I mean, yeah. for us, we we performed it in the Seattle Opera House, and it was a, a, basically a a kind of little play with music about lesbian pirates, written by Kathy Acker. And she told me she was, you know, I met her. And she said, "I'm writing, a, I'm writing a play about lesbian pirates." I've gone, Really? Have you got any pirate songs in it? She said, no. So we'll write some. And she went, oh, good. And then we ended up, we had about two two or three years of occasionally dressing up as pirates and singing singing these really, really vile pornographic songs, which was great but entertainment. The, the thing is, and I want to get back to the art, but there's a, I hate, I don't want to, a lot of the people who are listening to my podcast are obviously in, in business, in marketing, in, you know, more commercial endeavors. And there's a massive learning in here, which is, and, and I, you know, one of the you see these big companies I've worked with and for big companies, and what tends to undo them, amongst many other things, is the sense of finding the safe middle and sticking with it, and the fear of sort of taking a shot, because yeah, getting it wrong is far greater failure than taking a shot and learning from it. Yeah, and and it it amazes me that and that people don't see that and they know it. I mean, this is not, as I say, rocket surgery. Like this is obvious shit, but it, it, this translates into, and part of your journey is just, as I, as I read you and understand you better, it's like 
putting yourselves out there and it's like if it doesn't work what's the downside yeah i mean it's not it's not the world doesn't need desperately need another successful rock and roll band you know i right. I, I would say we learned that around the time of the first album because we had all these songs they existed in this world up in leeds uh we did two singles the first one was notorious some people refused to distribute it because it was they thought it was so unlistenable the second one was built by the record companies the mekon's new awareness of sound it was called where were you and it actually sold tons it sold tons of records for an independent label it was like number one in the independent charts got the interest of a major label but this all drags on for like and by then we musically the scenes moved on we're not really very interested and then suddenly we're signed to a major label and because of the shenanigans that goes on with major labels they've got you know they virgin owns this studio the manor so they ship us out to the manor and tell us this is a really great thing for us to do but really they've just got downtime and then they can charge shove you they in can there charge us a full rate for going to this stupid studio in the in the middle of the, a manor house in the middle of the countryside with go karts and kind of which was no need for us to go there at all it costs us a fortune and we go and we're like recording these songs we've written two years before when we should have been like moving forward. moving on to something else then you know we that album was universally yeah well you I mean something got some good reviews but it wasn't like it just wasn't that great it was a good it was like a record we were already we were at that age of being about 22 years old we were making a record of something we'd already done it was like we were you know archiving things we'd already done and it's like this just doesn't work for us so we went straight away into a little studio up in the mountains near leeds and started just making stuff in the studio and it was and we all swapped instruments and that stuff i still love that stuff i think it sounds fantastic and the virgin went potty and just said no you're fired Jeez, like... and got rid of us and then no one else would put it out and it was <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of like but that was the, that was the that was the right that was the best, right thing for us to do you know I mean, it wasn't like we were earning a lot of money on virgin but it was kind of like there was a status to being on a major label right. and we kind of to their mind, we completely screwed it up. But to our mind, it was like, what are we? Why are we? We're like these corporate employees yeah. feasting on our past from like two years ago and trying to like right. present this package in a different way to sell a load of records for a bunch of, you know, wankers. And, and of wankers. to your to your point, probably <laughs> the best thing over time, best thing that ever happened to you. Talk, yeah, talk to I mean, me. You know, and then Sorry, we actually ahead. we thought we we just like. Yeah, we, this is what do we actually do? And this is this is what we do. We we kind of like go off on these mad little voyages, and that's what it's been like ever since. And now the Mekons, at this stage, it's not in it to anyone a, a full time job. It's not basically doesn't really earn anyone a living. But we will meet up as often as we can, and we accrue money from the back catalogue, and we always put that back into just getting people together because everyone lives on different continents and it's like we get everyone together and just recently we went to Spain to Valencia and recorded a an album there and it's uh, it's not finished but we had you know 10 days in a recording studio and, and it was just a fantastic fantastic experience and again you know didn't really even have a clue what we were going to do when we got there just decided on what we were going to do to get it done speaking of which because you talk I don't know if it was in the documentary or somewhere else, but I recall you talking about the dynamic of the band. And I think it was somewhere in response to someone saying like, you're the leader of the band and you responded by, um, you sort of scoffed at that notion of and described it as sort of more of anarchy. Um, in terms well, of the, the right dynamic. sort of anarchy, though, you see. The right sort of anarchy. But it's like, yeah. talk about that. Cause it's I think like, that's where we, that's just where we were. We were in a, in the, we stayed in this place called Cabanyal in Valencia, and it's where the uh, it's where the Spanish Civil War kind of ended. But it's where this an area that was controlled by the anarchist trade unions. But you know their idea of anarchy isn't like Punk's idea of anarchy. Was anarchy's like, oh, hey, smash everything up. Uh, their <laughs> anarchy was like extremely. It was like the most grassroots form of democracy you could find. 
and it was very constructive and very organized. I don't claim the Mekons are very organized, but that's the sort of anarchism we aspire to, put it that way. Well, while, when I see performance sort of like organized, organized chaos, where everyone sort of naturally feels, you know... There is some chaos in the space. Mekons. There is some chaos in there that can be harnessed. But... So it's all good. I want to talk about the art, your art in particular, right? Um, of which there's a lot of it in different forms and shapes, album covers, T-shirts. Well, I'm very, very old. There would have to be a lot of it. (laughs) But I want to start by um, two descriptions from one man, Tony Fitzpatrick. He he describes you the following way. Or he describes you and your art the following way. And if, if I had this in my obituary, I'd be like, the world is all good. Like okay, he, good. He, he said two things. One, uh, his, as in your work, tends to put off all the assholes. And the second thing he said is his work repels all the right people. That's genius. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just read this. I go like, that's what I want <laughs> on my stone. Uh, to be honest, that's really been, I learned early on with the art. Tony helped me a lot with the art thing, but he did introduce me to the fact that which I worked out that galleries are pretty much the commercial galleries and the commercial art world is pretty much like the record business. No one's, everyone's afraid to have an opinion about whether something's any good or not until their superior has cleared it. Tells, tells also, it's good. You can only say it's good if it sells. Yeah. If it sells, it's great. If it doesn't sell, it's rubbish. But I'm of a more subtle opinion. And I think things, you know, I've been lucky because through through Tony giving me an art show, I actually first show I had at his gallery um, down on Wabash, World Tattoo. Uh, I sold everything, and I'd never at that point in my life. I'd, I was probably like thirty four, thirty five years old. I'd never thought of doing an art show, so it did give me a means to sort of support myself beyond scratching around with the music thing and uh, I thank him for that but my relationship to the sort of commercial art world is I have to be very sure and trusting of the people involved in it and understand that they understand what I'm doing and I do I do like he's, he's absolutely right there's a lot of people that really don't get what I'm doing and I think I'm I'm rarely included in anything that's I'm, it's almost like I'm just considered as a musician who does some art on the side and that's that's all right with me. Then I think, think that, some musicians think I'm an artist who does some music on the yeah. side. And that's all that, right as well. Because yeah, I like the I, idea of not, not quite knowing where I'm coming from. So. Not fitting in. Because I was going to say, we, I, I've i talked to people who go like, yeah, he's the artist and happens to play music. So I've heard both descriptions of you. Which yeah. I think is terrific. Well, some people come, to, I've, I've, you know, it's nice when people like really, some people really get the artwork and then they find out. Oh, I didn't know you did music. That's really, to me, that's really amazing. So it's not like people who are music fans are just buying the art as a souvenir. There's, you know, but but both the things come from the same part of my brain. Uh, the songs and the paintings are very, very tied up with each other. And um, I think just it falls between some, it falls into a nice crack, you know, put it that way. I don't say it falls into, I would definitely think it, it doesn't fit in those worlds, and I'm quite happy with. I'm quite happy with that. I like the where I show my artwork, and I like that there's a kind of usually the place I show my artwork. It's usually people who have a kind of like appreciation and understanding of music and stuff as well. It's I would I would hate to be you know spending the rest of my life trying to court rich people, whether they're gallery owners, record labels patrons you know just trying to court people and it, 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 it's it seems a very strange thing to me so I'll, i I've, i have developed some what well, i don't know what you call them like kind of guerrilla tactics it's like i do pop-up art shows i go away i do i'll always have some art with me when i'm playing a gig since the pandemic we've really enjoyed the small smaller gigs you play you know you end up playing a lot more but I, I like the kind of contact with people in, in smaller things. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's just to keep moving and not not get stuck in the same same patterns all the time. So, You still playing at the hideout? 
I'm I'm still unstuck. I, I, You're yeah, still I'm unstuck. Stuck. But that's I mean yeah. that I, I wanted you on the podcast just because I wanted to talk to you because you're interesting. Um, but I wanted you on the podcast because you're the epitome of unstuck in terms of not allowing yourself to get caught in the bullshit that makes you not who you are. And, and as I said earlier on, there's incredible parallels to how I see companies and individuals in their career who somehow feel like a failure is not getting it right. Okay. Or they have to conform to an expectation of what they think they're supposed to be. And there's an yeah. extraordinary amount of people walking around not being who they are, like not showing up who they are. And at some point, you got to get to the point and go, this is who I, like I'm open to improvement. I, I would assume you constantly, I mean, you've been very explicit. You've been, you're constantly exploring and evolving the art, whatever it is. But ultimately, you got to be who you are. And yeah. in, 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 the, in, the, in the, your world, as much as in my world, in the, in the business side, people spend an enormous, and too, like way too many people spend way too much time trying to be someone else. You know, and it's gone like, how on earth could you live that way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, I, I guess I want people to understand that the, the reasons I do this probably not financially motivated a lot of it it's a lot of it's more political and more just I can't help it but also you know I've also had this thing where well actually I'm I'm an artist I feel like I feel like a kind of working guy you know I feel like as a musician as well I don't mind being I don't mind not being the executive I, I, I don't mind being the guy who goes and does the hard work I quite like that, and I quite and I think musicians, artists deserve to be treated like like workers. You know, right. they get should be paid, they should be paid properly, and they should be given support. And uh, you know, it's the sort of areas I work in are the sort of last places to get anything. Like you know, when pandemic relief, it was kind of like kept a, <laughs> people kept advising me to apply, apply for these grants. You know. Right. I explain what I do, and it's like, why are you worthy of anything? Go away, fool! You know, but you know the music, the music stuff during the pandemic was actually pretty great because people collaborated, club owners and people got together, and they actually forced the hand of government to sort of pump a bit of money in the direction of that into the sort of what is you know grassroots culture, and I think like that sort of rock and roll at the level I'm doing it, and sort of the the way we you know i i approach art it's it's not i'm not going through the kind of like halls of academia in the commercial galleries and we're doing it we're trying to find another space to do these things in a more real way but isn't you, you sort of refer to yourself as a worker isn't the act of doing and making as important if not more important in the thing that comes out the other end if that makes sense, well, it's like there again. I get that gets back to that point of the Mekons. The way the Mekons make things is possibly what's it more interesting than you know. People say, "What's the Mekon sound?" You know what? You know, it's like well, there's many sounds, but it's the way it's the process of getting there is what's interesting and what's fun. I seldom like sit around listening to Mekons records after we finish making them. I love the process of making them, and I love the moment when you go, "That's done." It's like with the paintings as well. I don't have a load of my paintings hanging around my studio. I like them to be off into the world quickly, out of the nest, shoo, shoo. You know, <laughs> where, where can I where can I get your art if I want it? Where can you get my art? You could get my art. Uh, actually, the best place is a, a gallery I've worked with down in Austin, which is a very unusual, weird gallery because it's run by a musician called Randy Franklin. Yep. And it's totally unlike any sort of commercial gallery you would ever gone to. And uh, a lot of the, the art is actually there's a bunch of other musicians who show their art there. And uh, it's called Yard Dog, yarddog.com, www.yarddog.com. And that's they got tons of my stuff. And I was just down there a couple of weeks ago. We had a great time. But, we, you know, every time I have an art show, we do a gig in front of the paintings and a lot of the paintings are song paintings. So I'll sing one of the songs. I'll say, Oh, we'll do that one up there. If you want to sing along, just turn around and look at the painting. Brilliant. I've, I stumbled onto it. I was there in Austin once 
and stumbled onto the gallery, not knowing about you or the art. And I, I just went in. Um, it's, a be- it's a beautiful place. Um, that was when he was on South Congress, but South Congress yeah. has gone kind of sideways, sort of gentrified out of yeah. existence. There's a few good things to the left there, like the boot store and the Continental Club. But um, he's moved out to the east now. But he's, it's actually better. He's in a bigger space, and it's in with it in a space where there's other galleries and other kind of artists and craftspeople working. And it's it's been fun. I've only been down, you know, three times now to the new place since the pandemic. But it's 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 a good it's good vibe, you know. Let me know when you're there next. I'll come meet you, um, Mr. John Langford. My Welsh-born Leeds cultivated. Did I say cultivated? I am. Yeah, I love that. No one's ever described me as cultivated. <laughs> like a culture in a petri dish. I didn't like say sophisticated. Virus. Like a virus. That's better. <laughs> uh, always a joy talking to you. I really appreciate you putting time in. Um, uh, hopefully, you come back again. We talk about something else. But I'm I, up for I, it anytime you want, Clive. I'll meet you at the at, at, at the Mecca. Yes. The temple. I'll see you at the temple, my friend. See you at the temple. All Thanks roads so lead to the temple. Amen <laughs> to that. Thanks Bye. for making the time, mate. I appreciate it. Cheers. This podcast was brought to you by Screen Dragon. We break down barriers, make workflow, and unlock talent. Visit ScreenDragon.com to see our software in action.